<clears throat> Welcome to the Folk School on Willow Creek, featuring University Distinguished Professor Tom Ezern, singing and telling stories from the Salon on Willow Creek. I need a bed for the night, boys, and my horses need hay. I've been riding that grub line on the hot fish highway. <sighs> it was in the merry month of May. Started for Texas, far away. Left my darling girl behind. She said her heart was only mine. When I embraced her in my arms, I thought she had ten thousand charms. Her caresses soft, her kisses sweet. Said we'll get married. Folk School number 142. Now here's a confession for you. Most of the time, when I bring a song before you here, I think, oh, I've got something to tell you about it. I've got brand new stuff on it. This is a song I'm singing kind of as an example of the opposite. This is a song that's a little bit of a cipher. I, I, I can tell you where one great song catcher from the past, however, uh, encountered this song. Can you help us out with that, Dr. Kelly? With a passage from oh, 
Adventures of a Ballad Hunter by John Lomax of Texas A&M University. All right, happy to. Among my students in the A&M College of Texas was a young fellow from Denison, Texas, by the name of Harry Stevens. Harry had worked cattle in New Mexico and Arizona for three or four years, and he brought with him to college a handsome saddle, saddle blanket, bridle, spurs, and other equipment. His saddle was ornamented with silver. He used to wear his high-top boots and 10-gallon white hat to class whenever he could. Harry didn't like the college uniform, and he wasn't much interested in English literature, but he warmed up when I mentioned cowboy songs. He would stay after class and recite and sing songs to me. Now and then he would drift down to my home on Sunday and lean over the fence and sing a song to attract my attention. I never could get him further than the gate. Early in the spring, when the world was turning green again, Harry called on me one morning just as the bugle was blowing for the first class period. I went out to the gate on which he leaned. Well, Professor, he said, grass is rising and I got to move on. I'm lonesome. I want to hear the wolves howl and the owls hoot. Twenty years went by before I saw Harry again. Meanwhile, for years afterward, he sent me Western songs. Some I'm sure he made up. Some he doctored. Some he had taken down from the singing of others. One day I received a letter from him. He was on a ranch in southern Idaho. Enclosed were the words of what I consider the most beautiful cowboy poem in the language. The opening stanza runs, Oh, it was a long and a tiresome go, our herd rolled on to Mexico. With music sweet of the cowboy song, for New Mexico we rolled along. <laughs> you know, hon, as you read that, and as I read it before, I couldn't help, you know, uh, uh, John Lomax there at College Station and the student who took a shine to the kind of the grassroots parts of literary and historical study. I couldn't help uh, kind of envisioning that fellow leaning over the gate as Von Rothenberger from Kansas. <laughs> okay. You know? Yeah. Well, there we are. <laughs> But what we get from that is Lomax really didn't know much about where that song came from, and that most of the songs that he collected, he didn't know about much about where they came from. And quite a bit of the Willow Freak Folk School over the past several years has been pinning down some of these songs, where, which are dubious as to origins, and finding out, whoa, whoop, whoop, there it is. That's the woman, or that's the man who wrote this song originally. And then it goes through all these permutations and variations and comes down to us in present day in various forms. And that's all, all very interesting. But the difference is now, bang, I often going to hit these right to the headwaters. Some of these songs are not so easy to trace. Uh, particularly, this was, for instance, the songs of the Overland Trails. Uh, the, the, some of the trails are a little dubious for catching up with them. And why is that? Because they precede the advent of newspapers on the Great Plains. Likewise, the uh, songs of the open range cattle industry. We're fortunate that people like John Lomax and uh, Jack Thorpe picked up a whole lot of those and set them down in their collections, even if they didn't know much about where they came from. But they're hard to trace because, once again, by definition, they're out there on the open range ahead of the settled frontier, including the newspaper frontier, and they don't get picked up. Whereas these uh, farmer folk songs, the settler folk songs, oh, they're, they're bouncing around in the newspapers. Like I say, little old sod shanty on the claim, I don't know how many versions I have. I quit counting. It's around 50 or so, and there are more of them, many more of them out there. But others, the trail is a little bit uh, skippy. Uh, probably the best scholar for dealing with the Trail of Mexico is Jim Bob Tinsley. He was singing this song as his book, a book that's now about 40 years old, come to think of it. But uh, he is the one who pinned it down that this song, Trail to Mexico, early, early, uh, early, early in the year, it was early in the year, it starts out, yeah, it was early in the year, 
uh, is pretty closely parallel to early, early in the spring, which is really a seagoing ballad and an English ballad. Yeah, yeah, I'm accepting his proposition. We have no idea how that seagoing ballad took root uh, on the Western Range and became a cowboy ballad. We don't know who wrote the thing. We don't know who's supposed to be the singer, who's the persona. We do know that there was such a guy as A.J. Stinson, who's the one who hired the, the guy in the ballad, who's a, a, a proprietor of the New Mexico Land and, and Livestock Company, something of a founding father of uh, the uh, Anglo-American cattle industry in New Mexico and Arizona, took his first herd into New Mexico in 1882, got involved in some nasty range war disputes there. This song didn't just spring up, you know, like a weed out there. Somebody wrote this thing. It's got, it's got a voice. It's plotted. It's an elegant ballad. Somebody's going to find out this thing. It's going to show up somehow. You know, God willing, Dr. Kelly, yes. we'll be the ones who track it down. It won't be the first time that an unlikely prize has surfaced that way. That's the Trail to Mexico. Now, the other reason it's on here is because it is a ballad through and through. It's narrative. It's got stages of the narration. It's got dialogue in the middle of it. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Professor Berenson at Bethany would just love this song. You know, they, they, he would say, oh, now that, that's a thoroughgoing American <laughs> ballad. And thoroughgoing? I, and I could, I could hear him, his voice in it. He would probably sing it in a lower key than, I, than I'm doing. Um, yeah. Wonder, wonderful song. About the only thing that so far, I haven't been able to track it down the origins, but the only thing I can add to it is, I just read that song differently than other people. Uh, all other commentators say, it's about this cowboy whose girlfriend did him wrong, you know, and, and he, gets a, yeah, he gets the Dear John letter, so to speak, and comes home and then cusses her out. <laughs> I think he's more in love with A.J. Stinson and the cattle industry at this point than he is the girl that he left behind. Mm. I, I think that's when um, we'll get married next time we meet that little, what looks like a promise early in the ballad, it's starting to look to him like a threat by the time he comes back. And uh, I suspect he headed back west happy with how, how it came out. Mm. Yeah, uh, we, gotta find, I gotta, we gotta find that guy. <laughs> Well, let's see, let's see here. I've got a, somewhere I've got an order of service. What's next, Dr. K? Well, I get to talk about NDSU. No, say something. You Are you doing anything at the press? <laughs> well, tomorrow I'm going to be tuned in to any news on Facebook announcements coming from the Midwest Independent Book Awards. Well, um, you're able to look at whether, we can see whether you've got gold or silver. Yep, we're waiting to see if gold or silver for field notes. We know yeah. we have one of those. We just don't know which one yet. So I'll be tuned in for that. And um, we had fun this week and last week working with a media group that approached us to take Apple in the Middle, our young adult Native American novel, into audio and so we have professional readers who were bidding to to take this book into that kind of production um, we were able to retain control of some things for instance we wanted to make sure it was read by a native american woman yeah. and we got to put that in there that we have that option or that uh, that will happen <laughs> is apple in the middle of your greatest hit as a work from NDSU Press? It really is. Um, we have sold thousands of copies of Apple in the Middle. Um, yeah, it's the greatest hit and the author has gone on. I think she's written four books now for HarperCollins. Oh yeah, she entered the transfer portal, didn't she? Yes. Yeah, it, this is just like, this talks like coaching <laughs> college basketball. You, you, you bring, bring along a hot recruit and the next thing you know, they've signed for a Power Five conference. Yeah. Random so, House, isn't it? This was her debut yeah. publication that she did with us. Yeah. 
and it won all kinds of awards, got her lots of attention. And the timing is right too, because there was an obvious void for literature, for kids, well, and for adults too, about Native American life. Yeah. And she captured it beautifully in this story about a 15-year-old girl. And we're joking about this. There's no resentment that she's doing well off the springboard of NDSU no, Press. And and it speaks good, well to the press. So that, yeah, yeah, we have a very good relationship. And every time she gets attention, we get a little bit oh, of attention, well, too. It, so it all works out. Well, there are songs. There's still a lot. We're, we'll pin down the Trail to Mexico one of these days. Um, but again and again, and sometimes just kind of serendipitously by accident, a, a forgotten ballad just falls off the tree, plunk, on my desk. And this is a case of that. I've been teasing this here for several weeks. Um, there is a, a, the, the known ballad of the buffalo hunting industry of the 1870s on the Great Plains is the Buffalo Skinners or the Trail or, or the Range of the Buffalo that John Lomax, that was his favorite song to sing. You know, he, he loved to get out in public lectures and sing that. He kind of a show-off, wasn't he? Yeah, uh, the trail to the, 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 the uh, range of the buffalo. And we thought, well, that's it. That's the only ballad of the, bu of the uh, buffalo days. Oh, uh, oh, okay, until about four weeks ago when this one dropped in. And I was actually looking for something else and just scrolling through, hit it. It's in the Dodge City Times, September 29th of 1877. I hit this. Uh, a long, long article. At the top of it, it says, Address to the Hunters After the 90 Days Scout. Uh, okay, who are the hunters? The buffalo hunters in the Texas, in West Texas, the Texas Panhandle, and on the south down to Fort Griffin uh, into uh, southwest Texas. The buffalo hunters. Fairly late in the game, 1877. And in particular, ones that were hanging out, headquartering, out of what's sometimes referred to as Old Reynolds, Reynolds City, more commonly referred to as Rath City. After Charles Rath, the Buffalo entrepreneur of Dodge City. And so these people headquartered out of Rath City in West Texas, but there was a regular trail. They call it the Rath Trail from there up to Dodge City, Kansas. And they'd haul hides up there to market them. And then they, you hope they don't blow all their money, but often they did once they had sold those high. So it's a Buffalo Hunters ballad. Now the author, it says, by Vox Buffalo Rim. <laughs> okay, I got enough high school Latin to figure out Vox is the voice. And so this guy's, the author has invented himself a pseudonym, voice, Buffalo Rim is, translate that as the business of the, the Buffalo business, or the, you might translate it as the Buffalo affair. Buffalo Rim, Vox Buffalo Rim. No author listed other than that pseudonym. And there ensues under that a ballad of 36 four line stanzas. Well, I don't know if I can, <laughs> I don't want to belabor this, but this, this is a significant proposition. First, in the history of balladry, and second, in the history of the great buffalo hunt of the 1870s. Um, for the first time, I'm going to sing some of this. Uh, the, just a couple days ago, again serendipitously, hunting a search string, you know, a Vox Buffalo Ram, that sounds like a search string. You should get hits on that and not a lot of other clutter in it. Nothing, nothing. But then some other search string from it, clicked into a digitized Google book. But there's another Google book version of the same book in which the ballad doesn't appear, but this ballad appears in 1907 in a book called The Border and the Buffalo by John R. Cook, published in Topeka in 1907. So as an old man, this guy Cook wrote a memoir, his days on the Buffalo Range and other stuff before and after that and he published it in 1907. He put this ballad as a frontispiece with no identification who wrote it. 
And I don't think he wrote it because he's, re he's referred to in the ballad in the third person. Besides that, there are 36 stanzas in the uh, Dodge City version of 1877. There are less than 30 in the 1907 Topeka version. And when you examine the ones that don't appear in the 1907 version, they are ones in which the fellows are living it up perhaps a little bit too much in the saloons in Dodge City, including one fellow who's named in the old ballad in 1877 as uh, cozying up to um, one of the ladies of the evening in one of the bars there in Dodge City. And so I can just see this working here, this fellow Cook, who wants to put that thing in there because it kind of captures what he's trying to do in his memoir, but he thinks, yeah, these guys got kids and grandkids and they don't know need to know what everything we did in Dodge City there in the 1870s. And so he just took those out, but I've got them. Um, so this ballot, I don't know when it last may have been heard. It appears to have been written down in Wrath City, West Texas, and then been carried up to Dodge City and probably handed to the newspaper editor there. Now, there's one other element in this. This comes immediately on the heels of these guys, 40-some of them, it appears, having gotten into a shooting scrape with a party of Comanche who had gone off reservation from the Indian Territory. Uh, these are some of uh, Quanta Parker's people. Uh, but this particular party seems to have been led by a Comanche whose name translates as Black Horse. Uh, we don't know how many people we're talking. I think maybe we're talking a couple hundred people. And then 40-some buffalo hunters armed with, you know, crack armor, uh, uh, armory, <laughs> crack, crack arms, then went out. They thought that the army should be protecting them from these Comanches who were off reservation and who had in fact killed one buffalo hunter caught in an isolated place. Um, and since they didn't, they said, we'll just take care of this themselves. And they fought a skirmish with uh, those uh, Comanche, um, uh, but it was uh, indeterminate. And both sides went home again, I guess would be the way to put it. But all this turned into kind of a bonding experience. And so both the memoir by Cook, published in 1907, and the ballad, which goes back to 1877, are, they are bonding documents. You know, we, we are a group who stuck together in the hard times and protected one another and had one another's backs and all that kind of stuff. And we went through this experience together. Now, we look back on the days of the Great Buffalo Hunt, uh, perhaps differently than when I read Wayne Gard's The Great Buffalo Hunt in about 1972, and with a whole lot of regret and some disapprobation of the activities of the buffalo hunters. That's not in here. This is an attempt to establish a positive view in memory of the buffalo hunting industry in West Texas in the 1870s. And so here's the ballot and stands then like as a a marker, a marker of a point of view, a trying to establish historical memory of what went on there. All right, so I'm not gonna sing the whole thing. <laughs> uh, some of it I'm still kind of sorting out. Most of it I've got transcribed at this point, and I'm gonna sing some sections of it. Then say a word about it. tune, I've added that. No tune given with the publication. Okay, I'm ready. No 
Well, the merchant counts over his hard-earned gain. The lawyer looks out for his fee. But the life that the hunter doth lead on the plain is the life which is dearest to me. How often, my boyhood, I wish that the breeze would waft me to some place of rest. Away from the cities, away from the seas, into the heart of the west. Now I am sitting at midnight alone, and my dream realistic appears. Yet I cannot help thinking how poor I have grown within the last four or five years. But I look to that hour the hunter enjoys, where the campfire is ruddy and bright. And very much I wonder what all of the boys are planning and plotting tonight. At this very time I can fancy Bill Crest, and the firelight shines on his face. He's plotting some mischief, God knows what it is, to get square with the whole human race. There's Jack and Bill Benson, the latter's asleep, and his dreams do not indicate ease. For he's rolling about while he thinks of the scout and the hardship of living on cheese. Good Hiram and Foley on business are bent, the deacon's got hold of a pen. And may I presume that the letter is meant for a certain fair one in Cheyenne. So there's your first section of the ballad, and what it's establishing it is, it's this kind of romantic view out on the plains. How often in my boyhood I wished that the breeze would waft me to some place of rest and into the heart of the West. He's invoking Western mythology. And this is already in 1877. This is not 1907. This isn't added in that later version. It's in 1877, which means that people who are participants in the events of the day are already ascribing this mythic quality to them, the heart of the West. Also, he's mentioning specific people. And I won't sing all the stanzas where he mentions other particular people, but Bill Cress is one of them. Jack and Bill Benson. I can tell you, these are real people. Uh, there are a lot of researchers have had a fascination with the buffalo hunting industry, and you can look up master lists of buffalo hunters on the range in the 1870s. But in addition, this guy Cook mentions a bunch of them. Now, he misspells them there, and the balladeer in this text misspells them too, but you can match them up. A whole lot of things can be pinned down with this. Well, there follow then these kind of dubious stanzas where, you know, uh, George and Susie are sitting apart, you know, in the saloon, you know, they've had a, a, a spat and that sort of thing. But in the middle of the ballad, Vox Buffalo Ram, whoever he is, he begins to demonstrate some technical expertise about the practice of hunting buffalo on the plains. Some stanzas that go this way. First purchase your gun, get the LX improved, let the bore be at least 38. The smoother within and the less it is grooved, the more it is valued of late. Now that is perplexing to me. Uh, you, you, you would think that a well-rifled weapon would be what you want for range, but evidently not. This seems to indicate that range was not a big consideration in bringing down buffalo, that you could get pretty close to them and a Smooth bore weapon might be just fine. This, this takes some different, some additional research. For a suitable bullet mode, Vide Bill Crest, he can tell you of one thousand flaw. It is speckled all over, but don't forget this. Look out for the nick in the jaw. Next, hire a hunter to shoot through the herd. Don't hit the old cow in the lead. Be careful of this now from what you have heard. Alt White is the man that you need. Don't put any pegs in your buffalo hide. It is an extravagant trick. And you never will make a success of your work if you hire such skinners as Mick. 
With awkward employees there is but one chance Keep the fleshy part on the inside Or West will be certain to see at a glance All the holes that are cut in the hide Now you see the, the, the tip he's giving there. You know, you've got inexperienced or just careless skinners working with your shooter. They may be nicking the hides. They're going to get knocked down when they deliver them to Mr. West in Dodge City. He's a, a mercantile man there. And so you want to then keep a certain amount of flesh covering that nick on the inside of the hide. I'm not sure we'd be revealing these trade secrets. Oh, well, it's a little bit late now to catch them up and to trip them up in there. Then there are a number of stanzas having to do with saloon personages, including, just look how Tom Sherman is thriving in spite of a most apoplectic disease. In Dodge, they are reading his burial right when he smokes a cigar at his ease. Tom Sherman, we've heard of him before. Remember the Cowboy's Lament? As I was walking by Tom Sherman's bar room in Dodge City. There are some commentators, I'm not entirely convinced of this, who say that Tom Sherman, the bartender, himself shot that young cowboy wrapped in white linen in front of the bar room in The Cowboy's Lament. This, need, this needs a little bit more work. But this ballad says he has a most apoplectic disease, meaning he's given to fits of temper, I think is the proposition there. And they're reading his burial right, like maybe they're thinking he's going to be brought up on charges or lynched or something like that while he smokes a cigar at his ease. Yeah. And other personages show up in this ballad. Now I'm going to skip then to the latter stage of it. And you'll find we return to some mythic themes in this Buffalo Hunters ballad. I remember when Lindsay Baker used to portray a Buffalo Skinner as a historic uh, reenactment. Our friend from Texas. You remember Lindsay? Oh, yeah. And, of course, he, he made the Buffalo Skinners out. Well, not a good blind date, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be the only way they would get one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, clearly, this ballad is to make the, the Buffalo hunting industry a fear not just respectable, but the force of the American frontier. You know, they're, hmm. they're, they're like doing God's will out here. Really? Now they're back from this fight against uh, Black Horse's Comanches. Now some of the boys, since their trip to the plain, are not quite much given to roam. And I trust when they think of their trials and blames, they will live more contented at home. And had we all died in this destitute state, what a heaven we'd have of our own. With squirrel eye as warder and watch at the gate, and old Billy caress on the throne. Now, my boys, let me tell you what most I admire, excepting for women you mind. Just a man who possesses a chivalrous fire of courage and honor combined. And this is the most characteristic of those whose names it is needless to give. Yet I doubt not the current of fellowship laws betwixt us so long as we live. Enough for the present, perhaps she will think, I've carried my reader too far. Step over and give Billy Benson the wink, and let us stand up to the bar. Here's a health to our captain, so courteous and true. Here's a health to the gallant Jose. And though we miss catching the skin of our crew, we shall give them the devil some day. Thank heaven, my boys, for the land which is blessed with a frontier so boundless and free. So drink to the hunters and drink to the west and pass the red liquor to me. You wouldn't know what red liquor was, would you, Dr. Kelly? Cinnamon schnapps. <laughs> it could be. Around here, that's what that would be, wouldn't it? 
No, a red liquor means it's not a clear uh, whiskey, meaning it has aged a while and turned brownish red. Now, that, that's a generic term, 19th century. Red, red whiskey meant a whiskey that had been aged probably in barrels, you see, so it took on a tint. It's not like stuff you drink from a fruit jar anymore. Uh, on the frontier, it began to take on a little bit different connotation because people started adding red pepper and all kinds of other additives to it, and it got to be a fairly, you know, colorful item, uh, colorful beverage, red, red whiskey. Uh, the gallant Jose, he's a Comanchero. Uh, he's, he's, he's a known real personage. Comanchero is uh, a New Mexican, Hispanic, who trades with the Comanches on the plains. Well, and now he's scouting for the buffalo hunters in their hunt and in their scout against the Comanche. Well, okay, we'll, we'll leave this aside, but that's kind of a preview. I don't know how long we'll be at this, Dr. K. There, 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 there's a lot to sort out on these, this thing. But I'm convinced everybody in this ballot, and there are 15 people mentioned in it, they can be tracked down. And then these things like... Is a smooth bore really preferable for killing buffalo in these days? I don't know. It's possible that it had less tendency to heat up, like the bullet went out rather than through the through the rifling. You see, you see what I mean, right? And and the problem. That sound of a buffalo mates when it runs. No, no, that's that's the bullet goes. Oh, the bullet. Oh. Because uh, going through the rifling that helps it go true. But that might also cause the barrel to heat up, and you're running hundreds of shots through uh, this buffalo rifle, and maybe a smooth bore was more was better. You know, you could shoot for longer before you'd have to stop and and uh, water down the barrel and cool it. I don't know what I did with my order of service. You got one handy? What's coming up now? Well, you're gonna. Talk about events this weekend at Heritage Trails. Oh, oh okay. Um, some of you know that I'm, uh, one of my hats is I direct a little center called the Center for Heritage Renewal, often engaging in promotion of historic tourism. And um, it has a Facebook group called Heritage Trails, where anything that crosses my screen, something that's going out on going on over the weekend that has heritage aspects to it, I uh, uh, spread it around. And so you can find that Facebook group or Heritage Trails uh, and join up. Uh, if you join up and you try to post something, you're going to get held back a little bit. Uh, you know, you run a group like that. There's all kinds of people out there trying to crack it. You know, and so I had to put some safeguards on it. So if you don't, if you try to post to it uh, and it doesn't go through the first time, that's because it's on my desk waiting for me to find your message. And, and I have to approve the first one. And after that, you're good to go. But people are welcome to share information about activities going on that you may be hosting yourself. And of course, welcome to find out about things and tell your adventures to them. There, uh, okay, this time of year, there's always stuff going on on the Northern Plains. I think throughout the Great Plains, but it's a little bit different than living in, say, West Texas and North Dakota. This is a good time for outdoor activities, is what I'm saying, yes, in North Dakota. it's a good time all of a sudden. So lots oh, of things yeah. seem like they're just flourishing right now. Well, you know, it's light about 20 hours a day here, so you can do all kinds of things. Uh, I'll, I'll mention a few things going on here. Uh, the Old Settlers Day. I've mentioned Old Settlers as a quantity in prairie towns from the 19th century forward. There are still Old Settlers organizations, and the one in Burlington that's near Minot is having Old Settlers Day on Saturday, June the 17th, uh, that afternoon. Uh, this stuff is on, in, is po you don't have to join the Her uh, Heritage Trails to look at the stuff. So look, at, look it up on there if you're from that part of the country and looking for something to take in on Saturday. If you're more toward the central part of North Dakota, uh, Bismarck, Mandan area, uh, they run some interpretive programs, talks by their interpreters on specialized uh, uh, subjects of expertise that they have at, uh, uh, at Fort Abraham Lincoln State Park, south of town there. And this Saturday, uh, a talk given by the interpreter Daniel Hernandez 
He presents Horses of the Mandans. Now, I'd be interested in that, but I'm not sure I'm going to drive three hours to get there. But um, I, I, if, if you're closer, I'd commend it. Or, or passing through, I'd, I'd commend it to you. Topics include how the horse improved the lives of Mandan people, but unlike other indigenous tribes, they did not drastically change their way of life or their tribal structure because of the horse. It'll be, the program will be inside the reconstructed council house at Honest Lant Village at Fort Abraham Lincoln, and there'll be seating. You don't have to stand up for the whole thing. If you're out in the western part of the state, do we know any from anybody from Mott? Dr. K. Oh, yeah. One of our favorite characters. Kevin. Kevin Carvel, Carvel the sage of Mott. <laughs> um, I'm not actually talking about him, but if we were going out to see Kevin this weekend, this, and for those of you from elsewhere, that's the southwest corner pocket of North Dakota, um, and Mott. Uh, Mott. Uh, there's an art exhibit at the public library featuring the work of Janelle Brackle, who is a public school art teacher there who specializes in acrylics in the in the hangings that's in the library there but you go through Mott and there are these historic murals on business sides there yeah this guy Janelle Brackle did those including the first one which is kind of the you know pioneer uh, uh, pioneer uh, North Dakota and then other uh, topical murals in there uh, so you could swing by the library there you could go to the Highway 21 rummage sale. It's one of those on the highway where every town has one. They're at a big rummage sale at Dell Herner's place in Mott on Saturday. <laughs> He's got a three-car garage, and that whole thing is stacked yay deep of stuff that, that, that they're selling. So help, we'll go by and help him get rid of it. There's the Pheasant Cafe in Mott, you know, drop in for breakfast or lunch, or they're open out there like 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, probably anything you want you can find on one side or the other of the Pheasant Cafe there because you might want to spend some time because I want to recommend in particular if you're passing through Mott this week or any time you get into the Mott Gallery of History and Art the Mott Gallery of History and Art amazing place and in particular because they feature the work they feature the work of uh, let's get his right get, get his name uh, uh, Oscar Rogers, and Oscar is a, a, a is a nickname. His real name is Raymond Lowell Rogers. Somehow Oscar took for him, and he is an offbeat artist. Particularly works in metal, but he he's a painter also and works in other media. I don't know. You get a prairie town, and somebody like him settles in, and it's like you got a national treasure treasure there. So they have a whole room dedicated to Oscar. Uh, Roger, you remember this guy? Is this the one who did The Thinker? The Thinker. The, yeah. He's got Rodin's Thinker reproduced in iron. You know, as, he, as, as a motorcycle as, rider. As a, as a motorcycle rider, right. Yeah. And so he's got... As a biker. He, he's got the vest and open to the belly and the open, open <laughs> arms and that sort of stuff. Um, and, and scraggly beard. But I think the detail I like best is his right pocket. He's got a biker wallet. You know, a long wallet with the chain on it linked back to back, back to his belt. Oh, the biker thinker. It's, it's geez, it's driving horse driving from Fargo to Mott just to see Oscar Rogers biker thinker. And but there's a whole bunch of other stuff in there. You know, in the back in the ag area, they actually have a number twenty one Massey Harris combine from the Massey Harris self propelled harvest brigade. In 1944. Now I know you're impressed, Dr. K. <laughs> if, 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 if I'm making a point here is, oh, uh, he also did the uh, Guardian Angel at, at Richerton uh, and outside in the garden oh. there at the monastery, the St. Benedict in the garden. Okay. Oh, those, those are just wonderful pieces, okay. wonderful pieces. So if you're driving uh, I-94, swing off to Richardson and go by the Abbey and look at Oscar Rogers' work there. Just we're blessed to have people like that. <sighs> have any friends online with us tonight, Dr. King? We do. There's lots of folks out there from all over. They're kind of <laughs> calm tonight, though. 
Maybe they've had a real busy week with all this good weather. And calm. They're, they're, yeah, pretty calm. They right. didn't seem to be enjoying the program. Yeah, MJ Brenner, though, is on a concert on her way to see George, George Strait tomorrow. Which, which George? <laughs> so. Oh, MJ. <laughs> She's still stuck on George Strait, is she? she? I guess. Wow. Well, that's all right. He's held up better than Garth. Garth, Garth has kind of gone to seed. <laughs> As many of us are. But, you know, I've still got ballads. I've got one more to bring before you. And why, why did I tag this one on? It's kind of the pair with the Trail to Mexico. But this is another one. It is hard to track down. Now, it's not that there's an absence of opinions about who Joe Bowers was or who was the author of the ballad of Joe Bowers. It's just that <laughs> they're all cockeyed. Uh, Louise Pound, you know, is one of my is my favorite song catcher of them all, Louise Pound of Nebraska. And she published a couple pieces about the ballad Joe Bowers. Plot line, similar to Trail to Mexico, but in this case, the fellow goes out to California leaves his sweet bark behind in Missouri, gets out there, strikes it, uh, uh, strikes a fair bit of gold, comes back, and he finds that she's taken up with another fellow, right? But once again, I'm not so sure that he's that unhappy about it. I think he doth protest too much. So we're going to sing the story of Joe Bowers. And I thought this week, I'll settle in on Joe Bowers, and I'm going to get the goods on it and deposit it in Willow Creek song bag. I'm not prepared to do that yet. I'm not convinced that any of the scholars who, who have tracked down ostensible personages and authors about Joe Bowers have it nailed. But it's kind of like the other one, Trail to Mexico, huh? Someday we will. We'll get it. Okay. We're going to catch up. This is Joe Bowers. It's a song that emerged on the Overland Trails in the 1850s. Uh, in her... Uh, collection of folk song, Louise Pound says, this version was obtained from Mr. Francis Withy of Stella, Nebraska, who heard it sung many times when a freighter in 1862-65 on the Denver, Nebraska City Trail. It was a freighter's favorite. The song is composed to be sung by a Missourian, is supposed to be sung by a Missourian in California in about 1849-51. It was in existence as early as 1854. You see, she got no idea where it came from. And later on, she developed various theories, but I, I think her theories are a little complex. My name, it is Joe Bowers. I've got a brother, Ike. I come from old Missouri, all the way from Pike. I'll tell you how I came here and how I came wrong. If my dear old mammy is so far away from home. was a gal in our town, her name was Sally Black. I asked her for to marry me, she said it was a whack. She says to me, Joe Bowers, before you hitch for life, you ought to have a little home to keep your little wife. Says I to her, dear Sally, all for your own dear sake. I'm off to California to try to raise a stake. She says to me, Joe Bowers, you are the man to win. Here's a kiss to bind the bargain, and she threw a dozen in. When I got to this here country, I hadn't there read. I had such wolfish feelings, I almost wish I was dead. But then I thought of Sally, and made those feelings get Raise the hopes of Bowers, oh, I wish I had them yet. And so I went to mining, put in my biggest licks, came down upon the boulders, just like a thousand bricks. I labored late and early, I rained in sun and snow. I was working for my Sally, with all the same Joe. Well, one day I got a letter from my brother Ike, came from old Missouri, all the way from Pike, 
You know where this is going, right? Was the darnest letter that ever I did see And I brought the darnest news that was ever brought to me It said that Sally was false to me It made me cuss and swear Said she married a butcher and the butcher had red hair And whether it was a boy or a girl the letter never said But it said that Sally had a baby And the baby's hair was red well, okay. This, I can tell you, uh, my opinion, that's a music hall song. That song was sung, it was not written by Old Putt, the famous music hall musician from California who sang for the, the, the trail travelers to the West, um, because he didn't have it in any of his collections. But somebody like that, somebody who got up and entertained people in the mining camps and sang about their experiences crossing the plains, uh, that's the author, but just haven't pinned him down yet. It'll happen. Anything else to announce yet this week, Dr. K? Nope. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. Sometimes you're talking. Okay, let me get out what I need here to close this thing up in good order. You're familiar with the old song, Bury Me Not on the Lone Prairie, or uh, the, uh, the Dying Cowboy, as it's often called. And I've sung it here, and also traced its lineage back to um, a, a, a sailor song of the mid-19th century, which I know to have been present in North Dakota in the early 1900s, because Franz Rickaby collected it from a farm woman in Walsh County uh, in about 1920. Um, but that song, Bury Me Not on the Deep, Deep Sea, transmogrifies on the Western Range into Bury Me Not on the Lone Prairie. All right. Well, songs acquire new layers of meaning. Last week, I took Dr. K out for pizza, and I drank most of the pitcher myself, because I had a driver, you know. And we stopped in at the Old Ten Bar and Grill in Buffalo, North Dakota. Maybe that name of the town Buffalo is significant here in a moment then. Okay. But we went out just to have a bar and grill now at night, as we often do. But also wanted to drive out just east of town to the Old Cemetery. Because I'd heard... Now, the people in Buffalo tend that cemetery, that sometime a century or more ago, somebody started the custom, and there are various stories about this, this is to be tracked down, started planting peonies in the cemetery. I mean, a lot of cemeteries have peonies in them, but I mean, every row in the, grave, in the graveyard, it's peonies in between the tombstones, up and down, up and down. Some of them are white, Probably the majority are white, and the others are of the more customary pink. Uh, they were in pretty good bloom last week. I would say they're probably past prime now. I bet the first of this week they were just perfect. Yeah. And then late in the year, the call goes out, and you'll see the, the notice on the bulletin board in the old 10 bar there. Uh, volunteers should turn out on such and such a day to clean up, you know, to cut back the peonies for the winter. Oh. We should try to get cool. out there when that happens. Yeah, soon, Dr. we could do that. Well, if I don't have to bend over too much. <laughs> Can I do it sitting down? They're not waist high. <laughs> this is the subject of our calendar ballad for this week. It comes from our venture out to Buffalo. But it's grounded in that older ballad tradition. Oh, bear me 
Queen Hawk. On the lone prairie where the wild coyote will howl over me, where the buffalo paw. I've often wished to be laid when I die in a country place with a town nearby where the people talk as they're passing by or they pause to gaze at the prairie sky where the May sun warms young hearts to love where the oak and ash hold the nest of dove what they coo and say I would never Penny buds, they begin to swell. What they could and say. I would never tell As the peony buds They begin to swell See the buds unfurl In the morning hush First bloom the white and Then the blood Innocence of youth, pale purity, then the rosy pink for eternity. Oh, bear me not on the lone prairie where the wild coyote. Howl me, let the blooms unfurl in the morning hush. First bloom the white, then bloom the blood. the deer and the antelope play That was in the year of 83 A.J. Stinson hired me Said, young fellow, I want you to go I said, young fellow, I want you to go And follow this herd in the Mexico from the sea into the heart of the west How often at night when the heavens are bright with the light
light of the glittering stars Have I stood there amazed And I asked if I gazed The glory exceeds that of ours We now conclude today's edition of the Folk School on Willow Creek. We invite you to join us again next Friday at 8 p.m. Central Time for more songs and stories. <laughs>